Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Koskasi ECR seminar. Today, we have Benjamin Barang from Cardiff University, and he's going to talk about cosmology with uh, Rayleigh scattering. Benjamin, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, hello, everyone, and, and thanks a lot again for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be with you, albeit virtually. But um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to share with you this. Uh, project that I find exciting and that I've spent most of my uh, PhD working on, uh, which is uh, how we can do cosmology with the variety scattering of the uh, cosmic microwave backgrounds photons. So um, uh, here is a brief uh, outline. So first I will um, explain to you what got us interested in, in this project with my supervisors, uh, Dan Mierberg, and um, then I'll present to you what I mean and what we mean by variety scattering of the cosmic microwave background. I'll present some detectability forecasts for this uh, small effect with the next generation of uh, CMB survey. And uh, finally, I'll uh, focus on why uh, it is interesting to look for that signal and what we can do, what cosmology we can do with it. And finally, say a few words about uh, how crucial component separation um, will be for, for um, when we look for this uh, small signal. Okay, so um, so this this project and, and um, my research really takes place in the context uh, of, of um, cosmic microwave background of cosmology with the cosmic microwave background, and it uh, takes place uh, after uh, following basically two decades of uh, tremendous achievements uh, from um, that have uh, built the now standard model for our universe, uh, which is Lambda CDM. And this model has been uh, confirmed uh, by a lot of uh, data coming from different probes, but probably the, the probe that put the most stringent constraint on it recently was uh, the Planck mission. So Planck were the European satellites that provided um, maps of the cosmic microwave background, um, temperature and polarization with um, a really high um, sensitivity. So uh, on the left hand side here, you can see the kind of map that were produced by Planck at uh, different frequencies. Uh, so um, Planck observed the full sky and you can see in the center of the, of the maps, you have the galactic plane, which is really bright because we have a lot of um, uh, what we call foregrounds. Uh, in this case, it's mainly dust from our galaxy, uh, which is really bright and uh, obscures the, the CMB. But uh, these, maps shows you the uh, anisotropies in the cosmic, uh, in the uh, CMB temperature and polar, uh, this is temperature, but we also have the same for polarization. And uh, so these um, anisotropies are deviation from the mean uh, CMB temperature around 2.7 Kelvin. So um, the, we have uh, good um, reasons to believe that the distribution of these anisotropies is uh, Gaussian, and most of the theoretical model predicted to be um, Gaussian, which means that all of the information uh, enclosed in these um, maps can be uh, compressed into what we call the uh, angular power spectrum, which is basically a measure of the um, correlation between the, uh, temp between the uh, temperature and isotropies at a function of the uh, angular scale. So here we use uh, L, um, which is the um, multiple moments in the spherical harmonic transform expansion. And low L corresponds to large angular scale in the sky, and small L corresponds, uh, and, and large L corresponds to small scales. So here we can see some uh, plots of the um, uh, angular power spectrum of the temperature anisotropies in the top there. And uh, same for uh, two polarization modes, uh, which are E modes and B modes. These are two um, orthogonal modes that, uh, and the reason why we use these um, particular projection of the polarizations of the CMB is because they are sourced by different um, uh, primordial perturbations. And so it's, it's, for example, B modes are not sourced by scalar perturbation, they are only sourced by tensor perturbation. And so uh, splitting polarization in these two modes is, is more convenient. Um, but yeah, and so from these uh, angular power spectrum, we can then infer a value for the lambda CDM parameters and uh, also associate errors with uh, 
with these values. So lambda CDM is made of six parameters, H0, omega B, and S, tau, omega C, and And thanks to Planck and uh, a lot of a variety of other probes, uh, we now have a pretty uh, strong constraint on these uh, parameters. Uh, there's, I should also mention that there's currently a small tension uh, regarding the precise value of H0, which is the uh, current rate of expansion of our universe. And it differs whether we observe it uh, through the CMB or we infer it through the CMB or um, in a more, or we look for it in, in, in our local universe using um, supernovae. But I'm not gonna talk more about it. Um, yeah, so in, in, in a broad sense, now we have a good, I think we have a good understanding and a good value and a good precision on these. Uh, parameters and in my opinion the next frontier uh, really lie in extension of the current paradigm and that could be by the detection of uh, the sum of the neutrino mass um, extra relativistic species that would change the uh, ineffective parameters or uh, if we can measure deviation from the expected um, uh, Gaussianity of the, the DCMB and isotropies and so these uh, will be the key targets for the next CMB survey and, and lucky enough, they are uh, just around the corner. They, uh, there's uh, two fronts that are currently being explored to further constrain uh, cosmology using the CMB. The first, the first um, these anisotropies uh, will be targeted by ground-based experiments. And uh, two collaborations I'm lucky to be part of are the Simons Observatory and SIGA Prime, which, be, which will be um, two ground-based telescopes that will target these anisotropies in both temperature and, and polarization uh, on small scales. Um, on the other side, so on larger scales, uh, there's plan to build um, kind of a successor to plan, which would be a light bird, which is a, a Japanese-led uh, space mission to, to send the satellites uh, to target large scales, uh, especially in polarization with the hope to detect um, the primordial B-mode polarization. Um, however, at the noise level of these experiments uh, go down, they also pick up signals uh, that is not the primary CMB. So this can be um, some small distortion to the primary CMB. This can be uh, other astrophysical um, signals, but that also can be um, instrumental systematics or, or noise uh, in, in, in your uh, instruments. And so in order to um, to make progress on, on and to improve constraint on lambda CDM parameters, we need to mitigate the impacts of this signal on the observation of the primary CMB. And for some of these signals, we can also wonder whether they uh, carry some extra co cosmological information. So um, yeah, so that's the main context of where this project takes place. I'll also uh, spend just two slides to give you some uh, some updates on on uh, Simon's Observatory and, and CCAT Prime, on where the construction is at. So um, yeah, um, Simon's Observatory uh, is an experiment that is currently under construction and will, will be located in Chile. There's uh, basically two surveys. The first one will uh, use uh, this uh, six meter uh, cross dragon. That's a particular design of the layout of the two mirrors. So it's a cross uh, six meter telescope uh, that would, it's called the large aperture telescope. And uh, also the other survey would be a set of three smaller aperture telescopes that will target uh, beam-mode polarization. So the uh, large aperture telescope um, is under construction in uh, Germany. And the receiver that you can see here on the left-hand side, which is basically the cryostat that will hold all the detectors and the optic tubes uh, it's under construction in the US, uh, in Pennsylvania. So as so we'll observe the sky at six different uh, frequencies, uh, ranging from 27 to 280 gigahertz, and we'll uh, use um, more than uh, uh, 30,000 uh, transition edge polarimeters. Uh, the first slide is expected in 2022 with the uh, start of the science uh, campaign in 2023. Uh, CCAT Prime is another um, um, telescope also being built in Chile. So it's uh, actually the same cross dragon design as um, as the SO Large Aperture Telescope. It's called the Fred Young Sub Telescope. And it will be located slightly higher in altitude at 5,600 meters um, 
just above uh, the ISO site. It will observe the sky at a uh, higher frequency, and that's why it was high in altitude, so that we have less of an impact in, in, in the atmosphere. And so we can observe at slightly higher frequencies uh, from 220 to 850 uh, gigahertz. And it will also uh, use um, a KIDS array. So KIDS stands for Kinetic Inductance uh, Detectors, um, which is considered as the next generation of CMB detectors. And, and that's the, the, the reason why they are used is because they allow for a more efficient multiplexing, which means that we can basically put more detectors in the same uh, area in the focal plane. And uh, that we can, multiplexing means that we can uh, extract this information that is in the focal plane that is at below one Kelvin. We can extract it more efficiently and bring it to uh, room temperature. So the, the natural multiplexing of the kids arrays um, is believed to be the way forward to be able to put more and more detectors in, in the focal plane of these experiments. Um, and so uh, given the um, really uh, broad and high frequency coverage of, of CCAT prime, there's a lot of uh, science cases that will benefit from, from this uh, data. And this also includes a lot of galactic science in order to understand how uh, dust uh, form in our galaxy or how our magnet magnetic fields are displayed around uh, our galaxy. So as far as I saw, the first light is expected in, in 2022. Okay, so now that um, I've introduced uh, to you the, the broad context and, and the main player in the field with uh, SO and CCAT prime, uh, I'll uh, spend some time uh, explaining uh, and introducing Riley scattering of the cosmic microwave background, which is precisely a small signal that will hope will uh, be detectable with the next generation of survey. Okay, so what's, what is Rayleigh scattering? So there's there's nothing like purely cosmological about Rayleigh scattering. It's a well-known effect and it's uh, observed on Earth and it, it refers to the scattering of electromagnetic, electromagnetic waves, sorry, by particle which size is much smaller than the wavelengths of the radiation. And so this is observed on Earth when uh, solar photons uh, they are scattered by the neutral species in our atmosphere. And this um, Rayleigh scattering at the frequency dependence, as we'll see in a moment. And this frequency dependence is the reason why the, the sky is blue and, and the sunset is red. So there's, there's nothing really deep about Rayleigh scattering. It's, it's a well-known observed phenomena. And, um, and it's observed in, in the Earth's atmosphere like pretty much every day. And um, however, we may wonder if there's any other time in the cosmic history where we had high concentration of neutral species and a lot of uh, photons around. And that's precisely what happened right after the combination. So let me walk you through um, the, the usual recombination story. So that's take place around 380,000 years after the Big Bang and redshift of around 1100. And so the picture there right before recombination is that we have a plasma that is made of free electrons and free protons. And the photons that are around, they are kept in equilibrium with that plasma thanks to another scattering process, which is called Thomson scattering. So Thomson scattering is the scattering of uh, photons by free electrons. So as soon as you have enough, uh, as long as you have enough free electrons, the, um, the photons are trapped inside the uh, primordial plasma. But at the universe expands, it's also uh, cooled down, meaning that at some point, um, recombination of the free electrons with the protons in the plasma becomes uh, thermally favored, which means that the fraction of free electrons that are available for scattering uh, drops. And this is what you can see here in the blue curve. So you can see as we move, uh, which is um, which, which show you the fraction of free electrons as a function of uh, redshift. So as the universe expands, uh, we have a drop in the fraction of free electrons to the point where we don't have enough uh, free electrons um, to maintain um, uh, the uh, proton in equilibrium with the plasma. And so they start to free stream uh, more or less until they reach our detectors. And so this happened around a redshift of um, 1100. However, it's interesting to note that um, uh, recombination processes, they not only make the 
function of free electrons drop, but they also create uh, neutral species and mainly hydrogen and, and helium. And so in red, you can see the fraction of neutral hydrogen, uh, the function of redshift, and you can see that the fraction of free electrons drop, we create more and more uh, neutral hydrogen, which will be a potential targets for um, Rayleigh scattering uh, processes. Uh, however, these um, we, we could say that, okay, so at some point we will have only neutral species and so Riley scattering will become very efficient and will, will become dominant. But uh, the universe keeps expanding after recombination, which means that the density of uh, these neutral species will dilute and we means that Riley scattering will also become less and less uh, efficient. Another way to look at that is to look at the visibility function, which is um, a, a which is basically the probability that a photon uh, lasts scattered uh, at a given uh, redshift. So if we look at uh, Thomson scattering only, we can see that uh, at high redshift, the probability of last scattering is um, close to zero because there's a lot of scattering happening and the, the mean free pass of the photon in the plasma is, is pretty short. They are, they are free electrons everywhere, so they, they scattered a lot. And as the fraction of free electrons drop, the uh, probability of flash scattering increase until it reaches uh, its maximum, which uh, although it's not like a, a, a 2D surface, but um, it's often assumed because it's pretty narrow. And, uh, and, and yeah, and so what happened for Riley scattering is um, plotted in a dashed line. And, uh, and yeah, so as I said, Rayleigh scattering is a frequency dependent uh, process. It scales as new to the four to the uh, lowest order. And what happened is that in uh, at uh, high redshift, we have a very little neutral hydrogen uh, to, um, to, to serve as target for Rayleigh scattering. But as the uh, recombination happened, we have um, the, the fraction of um, neutral species increases meaning that Riley scattering process becomes less and less uh, likely. But we observe this um, slight delay between the uh, peak of the visibility function in terms of scattering and the peak of visibility function for Riley scattering. And that's because we need to have enough neutral species that are formed by recombination processes in order for Riley scattering to, to become um, efficient and, and non negligible. If we now uh, combine these two uh, scattering processes and are only if we are only interested in scattering in general, irrespective of it being Thomson or Riley, we see that by including Riley scattering, we have a small shift in the visibility in the peak of the visibility function, and uh, this shift is uh, frequency uh, dependent. So at uh, higher frequencies, this shift will be slightly larger. Right, and, um, and yeah, so that's the main takeaway from Riley scattering in that it produces a frequency dependent uh, last scattering surface. It also globally increases the uh, co moving opacity of the plasma, which is uh, basically the inverse of the mean free pass. So, by including Riley scattering, we have more scattering processes, uh, which means that the photon will, on average, travel for um, a shorter time or, or, or length in, in the primordial plasma before, between two scattering events. And um, this increase in the co-moving opacity is uh, frequency dependence because of the frequency dependence of the Riley scattering cross-section. So here we also include the scattering of a neutral helium, but we have this 0.1 factor in front to reflect that um, um, scattering by helium atom is slightly less efficient and uh, therefore is, is pretty much negligible uh, in our discussion. But this increase in the uh, co-moving opacity uh, leads to um, three uh, main effects. The first one is a damping of small scales and isentropies, uh, both in temperature and even polarization. On uh, larger angular scales, we, um, we saw that um, since the last scattering surface is shifted toward lower redshift, uh, the local quadruple will be uh, slightly boosted because the universe would have expanded in between uh, the Thomson scattering visibility function and the Riley scattering uh, peak of the visibility function. And this local quadruple is what sources the, lar the, the large scale emote signal. So we will we should observe a boost in um, 
in the angled uh, polarization signal. Also, the shift in the visibility function uh, would induce a shift in the location of the acoustic peaks, both in, in temperature and in both polarization. And um, this is uh, what we observe when we look at the fractional difference in the uh, power spectrum induced by Rayleigh scattering. So in uh, red, we have the uh, EE um, auto spectra. In uh, blue, we have the TT and, and in green, the cross correlation between the two. But we uh, observe that we indeed have this boost on uh, large scales for the uh, E-mode signal. And for boost temperature and uh, polarization, we have this uh, damping of uh, small scales and isotropies. And this uh, weekly behavior is uh, due to the shift of the um, uh, location of the acoustic peaks, uh, which, which produce this, um, this oscillatory behavior. All right, so uh, now we've seen all the effects that Riley scattering can induce to, um, in, in the primordial plasma. And now it's time to see how we can model um, the, these distortions and how these distortions appear in the, um, in, the, um, in the power spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. So uh, uh, at, uh, we can, um, and if, we, if we stay below uh, frequencies of around 700 gigahertz, these um, anisotropies can be uh, modeled as a linear distortion, a, frequency, uh, a linear frequency dependent distortion to the primary CMB. So for instance, we can write the um, ALM, which are the expansion of uh, the spheric, uh, in the spherical harmonic transform of the uh, CMB temperature and polarization and isotropies. So we can uh, model them uh, as being the sum of the primary CMB, so the usual Thomson scattering CMB, plus this uh, small correction that would scale as new to the four. We also have higher order correction from uh, new to the six and new to the eight, uh, which are the other, which are the higher order expansion and frequency dependence of the Riley scattering surface, but we can, we can neglect them for now. And so um, the power spectrum now is sourced by three different terms. The first one is the usual primary CMB, uh, the classical CMB. And if we look at, uh, and we also have um, this term, which uh, stands for the two uh, cross spectra between the primary CMB and the wireless scattering signal. And that scales as mu to the four. And we also have the Riley scattering auto spectra, which scales as uh, new to the eight. Okay, and so if we look at what these uh, signals look like, uh, in um, that's the temperature signals as a function of L. So in black, we have the primary CMB, uh, and that's at 500 gigahertz. So the primary CMB is frequency independent, so it, it won't be rescaled up, and, uh, up or down uh, as a function of frequency. In uh, red, we have this uh, Riley cross spectra, the, the new to the four component of that. And uh, in blue, we have the um, new to the four Riley auto spectra. So these two signals will uh, scale strongly with frequency. So this one will scale as new to the four, and the blue one uh, will scale as new to the eight. And so we see that uh, even though we are at pretty high frequencies, uh, this, the, this, the Riley scattering signal is still well below the uh, primary CMB, which will make it challenging to observe. But we also observe that our, we also see that our best shot at detecting Riley scattering is to detect uh, its cross correlation with the uh, primary CMB. And that's uh, precisely what we will try to do uh, with the next um, generation of, of CMB survey. So um, we, in the next session, we will, uh, we will produce um, detectability forecast for this survey and, and focusing on the detection of the cross correlation between Riley scattering signal and the, um, and the primary CMB. So there are essentially four different cross correlations that we can look at. And these are, um, primary temperature signal correlated with the uh, Riley scattering temperature, and same for T, E, E, T, and uh, uh, E, E. So these plots show you uh, in black, you have um, the cross spectra themselves as a function of L. In uh, dashed red, you have the signal to noise per uh, L mode. 
And uh, the bottom panel will show you the uh, cumulative signal to noise that we can have uh, at a function of, of Lmax. And so um, these are uh, forecasts, uh, including only the uh, noise from the experiments. They don't include the foregrounds for now. And, um, and we see that a plank at the vertical sensitivity to detect wireless capturing in temperature at least, uh, to detect it quite significantly. However, this uh, has not been reported and this has not been feasible. And that's, we think, mainly uh, because of uh, foregrounds that will play a key role and that will obscure uh, this signal. However, it's interesting to know that uh, Planck, uh, because of its limited sensitivity in polarization, had almost uh, no constraining power coming from, uh, um, uh, from polar polarization. And so um, the, the next generation of MB survey will precisely uh, improve on Planck on, on this polarization. And so we can hope to have some uh, improvement there. And so indeed, if we look at uh, SO uh, and uh, CCAT prime. Uh, we, and this is for the white noise only, so we don't include the atmosphere for now, just uh, the scanning the number of detectors that they have. Um, we see that they get a substantial improvements uh, in temperature, but we also start to have, I mean, it's not a lot, it's a, a bit of, uh, it's some signal to noise in, um, in polarization. However, this, since these experiments are ground-based, they, uh, they have to observe through the atmosphere, which had a lot of um, uh, noise on, on large scales. And so this can be seen um, in the next slide. So you see that if I flick uh, back and forth, you can see that we lose most of the constraining power in temperature, uh, and that's because we lose almost all of the signal to noise on, on large scales because of the atmosphere. Um, however, we also see that the signal to noise in polarization is slightly less affected by, by the atmosphere, and that, that's expected because the atmosphere will uh, hinder more the large scales temperature than the polarization. So, um, yeah, so the, the way forward seems to be to have um, um, observation of the polarization on small scales from the ground, which, has, which is less impacted by the atmosphere, combined with large scale measurements uh, from space uh, in temperature. And this is, um, if we look a bit further you know, and we look at uh, Lightbirds uh, and CMBS4, Lightbird being a satellite and CMBS4, the next generation of ground-based survey, we see that uh, we have a pretty strong detection of rise capturing in uh, most of the um, in, in, in temperature, and we also have quite a lot of signal to noise uh, in, in, in uh, polarization. Okay, so that uh, seems to be the way forward, um, but we've seen that, so the atmosphere plays a huge role, and, uh, these, um, and, and these forecasts don't include foregrounds, so that will be another thing, and it's, it, yeah, so, um, but all in all, if, if we combine large-scale information from the space with small-scale information, especially in polarization from the ground, we um, hope and we should be able to provide the detection of, of Riley's scattering. But now also, what, what's the point of detecting Riley's scattering? Is it just like, okay, it's nice to detect it? I mean, it, first of all, it's um, it would be really nice to detect it. Even a first detection would be interesting because there's absolutely no reason why this signal shouldn't be observed. It's a really strong prediction of really standard physics uh, on Earth. And it's um, and if we think we understand what's going on around recombination, um, there's, there's, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to detect wireless scattering. But uh, in the next section, I'll try to convince you that wireless scattering could also be um, a very interesting signal to do some cosmology with it. And it could really help a cosmological parameter estimation. And so the main reason why wireless scattering can be useful um, is because of the frequency dependent shift of the visibility function that uh, it produces. So um, these uh, shifts uh, in the peak of the visibility function mean that a fixed length scale in the early universe that projects to different uh, angular scales depending upon the frequency at which they are observed. 
which means that any cosmological parameters that will affect such a scale, this scale can be, for example, the um, acoustic scale in the plasma. So these scales will be observed at uh, different angles, um, depending upon the frequency at which it is observed. And so, uh, for example, we expect improvements. And for this reason, we expect improvements on omega B, omega, B, omega C, and, and, and effective. Uh, we also expect improvements in uh, YP, which is the uh, helium fraction. And that's because, as I said, the, um, the, the uh, scattering, the rise scattering by helium atom is slightly less efficient than by hydrogen atom. So, um, so if you have more uh, helium, uh, hydrogen, you should have um, a slightly lower amplitude of the rise scattering signal. We will also see that um, uh, rise scattering allows you to probe to probe new perturbation modes that yield a better uh, measurement of primordial non gaussianities and that uh, has been explored by a paper led by. Will uh, Coulton that came out uh, about a, a year ago. Okay, so um, we've run a feature forecasts for a more futuristic experiment, which is uh, PICO, which is a proposed uh, satellite satellite mission, where we will have a pretty uh, broad and, and, and dense frequency coverage, which make it extremely suitable to look for Riley scattering, but also to uh, hope to mitigate the impacts of um, of foregrounds. So here's the, um, the triangular plots uh, of the different lambda CDM parameters and the sum of the neutrino mass. And uh, we've uh, included in this plot four uh, cases. The baseline one is the green one, which is uh, PICO using an unlensed spectra. So that's PICO alone. Uh, then we can include uh, BAO information from uh, coming from DESI or DESI-like survey. Uh, we can include uh, Riley scattering for uh, PICO. And uh, in black, we have the cosmic violence limits, which corresponds to an experiment that would have um, no noise at all. And um, on average, we see that including Riley scattering is in the ballpark of the, it's basically the same, or it's close to the same benefit of uh, including um, uh, BAO information. And this uh, can be observed uh, in this uh, in this table taken from uh, a paper on, on this uh, subject, where we've um, designed different uh, cases uh, using, for example, unlens spectra or lens spectra, including or not including um, uh, a lensing reconstruction. Um, and, and yeah, so we see that for the parameters that we expected, omega B, omega C, and H naught, which uh, strongly depends on the uh, on the um, sound horizon scale, uh, we see that we have um, an improvement that is uh, between five and, and twenty percent, depending on the cases and on the parameters. So that's really good. I mean, that we will have more constraining powers to constrain lambda CDM parameters. But um, as I said, it's really interesting to look at extension of um, of the lambda CDM parameters. And for example, we can see that. Um, uh, if we look at the sum of the neutrino mass, we can see that um, using um, Riley scattering, we could have a, a larger than three sigma detection of the minimal sum of the neutrinos without relying on any external data sets. So without the need to uh, use a BAO information, we could uh, get this three sigma detection, which would be really nice because then we will only rely on one experiment that will be um, and it's always better to have only one experiment to characterize in terms of systematics and noise and et cetera. Um, and so with a single experiment, and it would only be like a CMB experiment, we could get a, a detection of, of the minimal sum of the neutrinos, which would be pretty exciting. Um, and another uh, interesting uh, parameters to look at is uh, N-effective, the number of relativistic species uh, in the early universe. And we see that uh, in this case, where we have lensed spectra, but we don't include uh, lensing potential, uh, we see that we have a 13% improvement uh, in, in the constraint on an effective. So we might, you might say that, okay, 13% is not that much, but um, we should put that in the context and relative to how hard it is to get uh, to an effective. So let me walk you through uh, this plot. So this plot shows you the one sigma error on uh, an effective 
as a function of what we've defined as the effort um, uh, relative to pico. So uh, an effort of one means pico, uh, an effort of two means basically um, either doubling the number of detectors in um, in pico or integrating for as long or uh, so yeah. So this kind of of uh, efforts and so. Um, uh, the black line show you the um, expected um, the expected improvement for uh, Pico only, and we see that uh, the certain percent improvement that we get by uh, including Rayleigh scattering corresponds to um, roughly an effort of uh, sixty uh, if we would want to do that without uh, including Rayleigh scattering. And so the this uh, the reason for that is because most of the constraining power on an effective coming from the CMB comes from the small scales. And these small scales are exponent exponentially damped uh, because of uh, damping processes and diffusion damping in, in the primordial plasma. So they are extremely harder and harder to get and the constraining power uh, drops exponentially uh, with, with the, the, the scales. And so, um, so yeah, if we want to uh, use PICO, uh, so yeah, so this study percent improvement is uh, in fact highly non-trivial to achieve. And uh, yeah, it would mean that PICO would have to pack uh, 60 times more detectors or wait for 60 times longer, uh, which is which is unrealistic. But, um, but yeah, so it shows you that variety scattering could really help you to make this a small extra uh, efforts and, and help you uh, in a small way, but that would be highly uh, non-trivial to achieve otherwise. And uh, so finally, in, in this paper led by William Coulton, we explored how Riley scattering could be used to uh, further constrain uh, non gaussianities And we found that, uh, so here are plots for three different shapes of light spectrum, local, equilateral, and orthogonal. And the bottom panels show you the uh, improvements thanks to uh, Riley scattering compared to uh, Thomson scattering only. And you can see that as a function of, of noise, we can get to up, up to an improvement of um, two or larger than two uh, thanks to uh, using um, Riley scattering. But that's also uh, really interesting, although the noise level here uh, are for extremely futuristic experiments. It's, um, it was an interesting exercise to do. and, and, and I think strengthen the case for um, the, the interest in looking for Riley scattering. Okay, so as I said, however, these, um, these um, science cases are really interesting. A first detection has yet to be achieved. It was not found in Planck, although it, it should have been able to do so, and that's mainly because of, uh, of foregrounds. However, we are lucky enough that two experiments will uh, observe the sky um, uh, very soon and, um, and we'll bring in additional information on small scales, especially polarization. And, and for TCAT prime, it will also um, observe the sky at way higher frequencies, which means that not, on, not only we will have um, 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 more chance to observe the signal, but we will also have way more information to characterize the foregrounds and um, eventually refine their modeling and in the hope to uh, mitigate their impacts on the observation of, of uh, primary CMB. And to that extent, we are uh, currently exploring two different separation methods. The first one is uh, what we call a constrained ILC. So it's an internal linear combination of the frequency maps. And this is done in the context of CCAT prime and will, uh, should lead to um, a publication uh, pretty soon that is led by uh, by uh, EEG, uh, which is a student of uh, Professor Nick Battaglia in Cornell. And uh, we are also developing a semi-parametric component separation for method for ISO, uh, for which I'll say a few words in, in the next couple of slides. Uh, and this takes, like, takes part, as uh, we discussed earlier, in, in a broader context within ISO to, to have multiple uh, component separation pipelines. So yeah, let me say uh, you tell you a few words about, about component separation. So um, unfortunately, CMB experiments they don't they're, they're not able to produce um, straight away CMB maps. Instead, they uh, produce uh, linear noisy mixtures of signals that have different astrophysical origins. So the CMB is one of them, but we also have a variety of uh, other uh, signals which are called foregrounds. Uh, that can uh, be sourced by extragalactic uh, sources or um, by sources in our own galaxy. And so, this 
frequency maps that are, are the products of CMB experiments on the left. Um, uh, they need to uh, be um, separated and we need to, uh, from these frequency maps, go to maps of the individual components. Uh, so examples are the cosmic microwave background, the cosmic infrared background, and at some point one day, I really hope that we will have a variety of scattering map there, but it can be any other signals you're interested in. And so uh, component separation is, uh, is this problem of going from frequency maps to component maps. There's a broadly two uh, main way to do that. The first one uh, is called blind methods, and they rely on, on a very limited set of assumptions. You only on the, you usually only assume the frequency scaling of your signal as a function of, um, of frequency. And, um, and they typically rely on an uh, internal linear combination uh, of the frequency maps. And the other broad range of family is uh, parametric methods, where you explicitly model all of your signal, you fit that model to your data, and then you can read out the um, different components. However, both of these approach have their own limitation. And in an attempt to overcome some of them, we are working within SO to develop a semi-parametric uh, component separation methods. So how does that work? It basically follows the um, framework for a uh, sneaker that was uh, developed and implemented for Planck. And so um, it works by first uh, computing the empirical frequency uh, covariance matrix by uh, taking all the um, cross spectra between the different frequency maps. And then we define a model for that same um, uh, um, covariance matrix. And um, then we measure the mismatch between these two models and we fit the model to the data. But the um, uh, the interest and, and the strength of this framework is that we can use a lot of different things uh, for the model. We can first um, have a more parametric approach where we would uh, explicitly define all of the uh, spectra, cross spectra, frequency uh, dependence with some physically motivated model and uh, fit these to the data. But we can also choose to let uh, either the um, um, band power, so each of the CL uh, of the power spectrum band power can be left as three parameters of the model, or the uh, frequency scaling could also be um, um, set at the three parameter. And in that case, we would uh, let the data alone indicate what is the preferred model and what is the preferred structure for, for the data. And so this framework really enables us and uh, will enable us to um, put any amount of a priori um, assumption or a priori information that we have on the foregrounds in this model and to make the, um, the feeding and the, the foregrounds uh, extraction or the component separation more, more efficient. So this technique are currently uh, under, um, under development and implementation we hope to be able to apply them to realistic sky simulations uh, within SO pretty soon, and um, and it would be interesting in a second time, to, in a in a in a in a slightly longer term, to see whether they can be applied uh, to um, uh, recovering the right scattering signal more efficiently. Okay, and so um, to conclude, um, as we've seen, right scattering is a weak signal, but yet it's robustly predicted. Uh, there's absolutely no reason why it shouldn't be there. So it's just a matter of how uh, soon we will be able to detect it. Uh, its first detection, we believe, could be achieved within the, with the next generation of CMB survey, especially because they'll provide more information about the programs that might help us mitigate the impacts on Planck uh, data, because we saw that Planck had the sensitivity to detect it. Um, and uh, we believe that future space missions, such as PICO, will be able to uh, go one step further and use this signal to further constrain lambda CDM and extensions. And uh, we've also seen that component separation and foreground mitigation will, will play a crucial role uh, in, in, in the first uh, detection. So thanks a lot for your attention. And if you have any uh, questions, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to answer them. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone have a question? Well, uh, first I'll start with some questions but until people come up with it. So yeah, so it's, well, thank, thanks again for a uh, super interesting talk. 
Um, in Planck, uh, you said like because of the foregrounds, it was difficult to detect. Uh, right. But um, what kind of foreground foreground makes it hardest to detect? Um, this right, right, Yeah. Okay. So um, so the um, the so because of the strong scaling of Rayleigh string with frequency means that the signal is brighter at uh, higher frequencies. However, uh, there's uh, mainly galactic dust from our um, galaxies that um, also scales pretty strongly with frequency. It's not the same scaling. So in principle, they, I mean, you should be able to, to differentiate these, these two um, signals, but um, basically that's what you see. Uh, uh, if, oops, sorry. In, in these maps, so the, the bright um, galactic, the bright thing of, uh, along the black line is uh, at frequencies, which means that although the signal is higher there, um, so for example, if you do a, a, an, an ILC, so internal linear combination, because of the scaling of the, the signal with frequency, these um, maps will tend to be up weighted, so because they, they contain more signal but they also contain more foregrounds. And so um, basically any foregrounds that scale strongly with the frequency and that gets brighter at higher frequencies will be um, um, a, a, a concern for the detection of, of Right, uh, thank you. Uh, I see a question from Christoph. Yes, hi. First of all, very nice talk. Uh, one question. So you mentioned a few ground-based experiments, and there's one thing that's almost a little bit something I didn't fully understand about ground-based uh, CMP experiments is how they can only cover a part of the sky, not the entire sky. Do you expect any biases from dipoles or yeah, something like this because you have a gradient to the dipole in it or some is handled? Yeah. So yeah, so that, that's that's um that's a good question. So um, for example, from the South Pole, we uh, from the, the from Chile, we expect to be uh, only able to cover half of the sky, and that's uh, including a cut we make to not observe the galaxy, which is pretty bright in, in foregrounds. So there's um, usually a, a limitation in, in in the so we cannot recover the largest scale because they would span. Um, a really large area of the sky that we don't have um, uh, access to. Uh, so there usually a cut where it said that we cannot observe below L of like 30 for this reason. Um, but then uh, the um, atmosphere uh, also uh, has a huge impact, which means that in practice, we cannot observe uh, these scales anyway. Even if we would like to observe them, they are uh, obscured by the by the uh, by the atmosphere so um and so regarding um so yeah so dipole which is l of uh, two uh, which wouldn't be able to we wouldn't be able to observe such a dipole however because the the um, temperature and isotropies are expected to be um, um cautionally uh, distributed and, and homogeneously distributed across the sky it shouldn't matter whether we observed um, the North Hemisphere or the South Hemisphere. There's, there's been some concern in the community that most of the um, experiments uh, observing the CMB observe it from the, the South. So there's a, a, a base in the South Pole where they observe the, the CMB and, and Chile, which is also like the Southern Hemisphere. And, um, and yeah, the, the, the main reason for, for that is because they, 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 it's hard to find a good place to observe the CMB. You need a pretty stable atmosphere and a pretty dry atmosphere. And um, and so there's the Atacama Desert, which is really good, and the South Pole, which is also a um, really good and really stable atmosphere. But it's hard to find places like that in, in the Northern Hemisphere. But um, yeah. OK, um, I see a question from Benedict. Hey, yeah, uh, thank you as well for the great talk. I wasn't really aware of this effect. So it's good that I, I learned a lot of new things today. Uh, I have one question though about the semi-parametric uh, component separation method. Yeah. Uh, do you understand correctly that you had to assume uh, CL for the CMB itself? 
So, um, so that's that's um, the the strength of the method is that you can do both basically with the same. We hope at least with the same uh, optimization routine and the same framework is you can either um, say, okay, my CL is uh, I I have a physically motivated model for the CL, which would be for example. Uh, uh, the outputs of uh, Boltzmann code, where we, you would input your um, your uh, lambda CDM parameters, and you then get CLs that you can plug in there, and etc. So it's really kind of like a, a feeding of of. Uh, so you would fit essentially for the parameters that best fit the data, but you can also uh, let each of the um, CL in your bin. So if you bin your data in like twenty bins, you would have twenty three parameters. And the parameter would be the, the value of the CL itself. And so uh, then you can fit for that, get the CLs. And from this CL, you will be able to, uh, in a second step, run some like MCMC or like some likelihoods to um, find the value of the parameters that best fit these CLs. Okay. So well, if, you, if you would use the, the first uh, way that you described, then I guess you would have to build it in into your MCM scheme where you would do your parameter fit yeah. as well. So, so the, the, the reason for, um, so for example, Smika, what they did is uh, they had, uh, uh, Smika is the, the basically the same approach, but uh, that was applied to Clank. And so they did that in two runs. So the first run, they let uh, both the um, frequency scaling of the signals and the um, CLs as three parameters. So they did the first fits around the acoustic peaks where they, the CMB signal is the, the, the CMB power spectrum is the, the stronger. And uh, they found some value for uh, the, uh, the CLs and, and the frequency scaling, and then, then fixed the frequency scaling and only fit it for the CLs on, on a larger set of data. And so they, they the, the main output that they have is um, a CMB power spectrum. And then from this power spectrum, they uh, were able to run the Planck likelihood on, on that. And so the reason for um, doing that that way is because um, if you uh, have the CLs as three parameters, it's you have easily a lot of parameters, more like like hundreds or like several hundreds parameters, uh, which is not really suitable for um, MCMC like approach where you would need to explore the whole parameter space. So they instead use some um, more um, analytic methods to directly solve the um, these uh, these problems, so to minimize the the KL di divergence um, really quickly. So it was we able to to run uh, a lot of uh, tests and a lot of thing in the thing that would take only a few minutes to to converge without having to run like long MCMC chains. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that that was the the idea behind um, behind doing this in two steps. So first getting the uh, power spectrum, and then from the power spectrum getting the parameters in another with another code and another fit basically. Okay, well, thank you. All right, any other questions? Uh, can I ask like one about this uh, constraining primordial and sanity using uh, Riley? Yeah. I wasn't aware of it. So, yes. Yeah, so how how does it work? So, do you take the uh, ALM ALM's like difference from Rayleigh scattering and then take the pi spectrum using that, or yeah, so where does the constraint come from? Yeah, yeah. But uh, so the the reason for the improvement, I think, is um is quite interesting. And um, if if uh, yeah, maybe I'll. I'll, I'll, I'll I struggle explaining it, but if you have one more detail, it's all in well, well explained in, in Will's paper. But I think the idea is that um, so you expect some um, you expect some scaling of the uh, sigma FNL as a function of uh, L max, uh, and and it has been shown that uh, some of the um, some of these shape they don't really um, um, so you expect that if you if you uh, have more uh, modes, access to more modes, that you should like basically, if you double the number of modes, you should 
get a sudden scaling of, of sigma uh, fml uh, as a function of that and so um the, these shapes some of them they don't uh, really expect uh, respect that scaling with it's not consistent with doubling of the number of modes There's, they have different scaling with, with l max and the reason for that is because um if, if i understood correctly is because they um you have uh, damping of small scales uh, because of diffusion dumping in the parallel plasma and also the fact that the visibility function has a finite width it kind of like blurs everything out on smooths and it's, um like cautionaries basically so you remove some non cautionity and so um by including rayleigh scattering and by having this frequency dependent um, uh, last scattering surface you basically uh, are able to undo part of that blurring and so you uh, recover the um, the expected scaling of the um, of the uh, of the of the uh, sigma FNL as a function of, of Lmax. So it's not so much that I mean, it's not so much that you get some new information per se, but it's more like you are able to better recover information that should have been there in the first place. Does that make sense? Or uh, yeah, it's super interesting. Oh. Of it going yeah, so I think I think it was consistent with um so um uh, Dan Mierberg's students uh, Alba uh, Kalaja sorry if I mispronounced the name she she wrote a paper um about this scaling and and the theoretical motivation for this scaling uh, I think it was last year and uh, and we found that the, I mean this paper came after the uh, Wills paper. But um, basically, I think everything is is like is is. I mean, you can explain the the improvement thanks to right scattering because of these scattering and how they. Uh, it's easier to make to, to do them uh, with with right scattering. Thank you. Uh, so it's almost time. Uh, if no one else has questions. In that case, uh, let's thank our speaker, um, Benjamin, again for a great talk. And uh, the ECR seminar, uh, the next one is in two weeks on the same time on Thursday. I'll stop the recording.